everybody, and welcome to a very special edition of a Florida Friendly Landscaping Educational Program on this um, end of October. Not really Halloween week. Halloween is next Monday, but we're getting pretty close on October 26th. So I thought it would be fun to talk um, about some creepy crawlies about the the cryptic lives of Florida bugs. And let me tell you, we are going to have themes of cannibalism and zombies and dismemberment and all kinds of uh, interesting, interesting things will pop up. You never know what's happening, you know, right under your feet, maybe above your head, but right around us. And joining me today is, of course, my partner in education and world-renowned entomologist, Dr. William Lester. Thank you for joining us, Bill. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I also would like to uh, send a shout out to our friend, Alice Mary Hurden, because I'm using a lot of her photographs. She's got some amazing um, photographs here of Florida's insect world. So very happy that she allows me just to go in on her Facebook and her blogs and take whatever I want and <laughs> um, use these, these great photos. And a lot of the other photos are from the University of Florida. And some I had to find a few other places like Wikipedia. Here are our emails. Um, in case you have any questions um, and want some follow-up, this is really the best way to reach either one of us. I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities in the, the Water Conservation Department. My email is lilyb, that's two L's in the middle. If you find you keep getting it bounced back, check to see that you put those two L's in the middle, lilyb at hernandocounty.us. And uh, the really hard questions, especially about insects in general, goes to uh, W. Lester at ufl.edu. If um, when you watch this again, it's being recorded, so you may watch it on Facebook this afternoon. It'll be on YouTube eventually, um, on Hernando County Government YouTube. But you can email me and say, hey, I'd like a copy of the uh, of the PowerPoint that you gave. I'll be glad to give you a PDF copy. Also, what I will do is add all the links to the resources right in the body of your email so that you can click right on them and find just where did I get that information from. <laughs> Here are the nine principles of Florida Friendly Landscaping. I'm going to touch a little bit on insects in general, not necessarily how to manage them, but maybe if you need to manage them, Dr. Lester's going to bring a lot of that up today. And speaking of insects, before we get into the, the cryptic lives of our Florida insects, um, what benefits? You know, a lot of people, they move to Florida and they are led to believe one of the first things, you know, you got to it's your change of address. You've got to make sure the irrigation system is working. Whole other topic for a whole nother day. And you've got to secure insect control in and around your house. What do you feel about that, Dr. Lester? Well, first of all, I have not had any kind of pest control in, gosh, I don't know, 30 years or so at this point. Um, well, I'm able to control whatever little problems I encounter on my own. A lot of people do move here and they just hear old wives' tales or something from the neighbors or just, you know, something on Facebook that they're overwhelmed with insects in Florida. And sure, we have plenty of insects here, but the vast majority of them are not going to be a problem. Don't think that you have to um, hire a service to come out every 30 days to just barely keep on top of it. There's a lot of things that you can do to keep an eye out for any little pest problems that you might have and handle them. That's what we're here to help with. We identify things for you. We give you recommendations how to control them if you need to. But insects are so very, very important in so many different ways, like you can see on the slide for 
pollination. We're all familiar with honeybees. And there's hundreds of other species of native bees that are all involved in pollination. They eat the bad guys. And that's a lot of what we're going to see today. We're going to see some predators that eat other insects or other things. They improve your neighborhood, you know, butterflies and birds, because they are such an important food source for birds. Mm -hmm. Funny people will move into a sterile um, subdivision. They have no trees. They have only lawns. They get everything sprayed with chemicals every 30 days. They wonder, how come I don't have any birds? Where are the butterflies? Why don't I have butterflies in my yard? Well, you've made a very, very inhospitable situation for them. They don't want to come. They don't want to come and live in your yard. They'll come and live in my yard and Lily's yard because we don't spray. We have plenty of stuff for them to eat. We don't worry about them. We just kind of let them be. And we got plenty of them. Mm -hmm. Insects aerate the soil also. And there's, and we're going to see a couple of other beneficial things they do that maybe you don't really think of that often. Okay. Now, before we move much further, if you are joining us today and you have a problem particularly with spiders or any other kind of creepy crawlies, there's going to be photos <laughs> of spiders and other bugs in this presentation. Now, probably you have not logged on if you don't want to look at them. But I know in some of the Facebook groups that I follow that might be just about living in Florida in general, there are people who tend to get very upset if somebody posts a photo of an insect, a spider, a snake. To me, that's like, well, this is called a living in Florida, <laughs> you know, Facebook group. That's part of living in Florida. But just so you're aware, we're going to see spiders and other creepy crawlies. And there's one section of this, and I made it, that I really particularly don't like. So I'll let Bill really take over at that point. Let's get started, though. Our first insect we want to highlight um, are, in our creepy crawlies, a Assassin bugs, da, na, 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 na. and in the family of assassin bugs, we have here this uh, particular species called a wheel bug. And I'll let Dr. Lester talk about this uh, this creepy guy here. Sure, wheel bugs are in um, family of insects known as assassin bugs, and there's a number of different species, but one of them that people see quite a bit in their yards. Usually late summer, they'll see the adults. So uh, the two left-hand side pictures here are adults. And you can see on their back, they have, it almost looks like somebody took a little tire, cut it in half and stuck it on their back. And it's got little spikes on it. So they look pretty distinctive. Very large insect, um, very beneficial because they eat a lot of pest insects. The bottom left-hand picture here, he's eating a puss caterpillar. Now, if you touch that caterpillar, some of those, believe it or not, that little blob with all the fur on it is a caterpillar. And a lot of those hairs will sting you. And some people have gotten stung by them. And it involves seeing a doctor, trip to the emergency room. I've never had it happen to me, but I've heard it hurts really, really bad. There's not a whole lot they could do for you. It goes away in like a day. But wheel bugs eat them. They eat other caterpillars. They eat a lot of different pests that eat your plants in your yard. They eat good insects also. They eat ladybugs, honeybees, whatever they can grab a hold of. And they consume it like you would consume um, uh, a little drink box, you know, a little box of juice. Mm -hmm. You take a straw, you poke it in. The wheel bug takes his mouth part, that large pointed spike at the front of his head, pokes it into an insect and sucks the contents out. And that's how they feed. And if you catch them? one, and what is that called? A proboscis? Proboscis, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you catch one and start playing with it, they could poke you with that proboscis. And once again, I've heard that really hurt. It doesn't hurt so bad that you're going to have to see a doctor. Probably not even as bad as a bee sting, but it will definitely get your attention. Uh, and it's just telling you basically, go away, put me back down on the ground, or I'm going to poke you again. Yes. So they can, they can defend themselves. So you don't want to pick them up and start playing with them. And um, like um, some other insects out there, apparently 
when the female, when the male has completed his job, she then <laughs> devours him, which, you know, not necessarily a bad thing, but, <laughs> um, and I also, it says strongly attracted to turpentine oil. I find that very interesting. I don't know any of us anymore who have turpentine oil lying around, but turpentine was a huge industry in Florida in its early days. Um, so I wonder if, you know, when they, um, you know, got got the turpentine out of the, the pine trees, if there were a lot of stink bugs, I mean, sorry, assassin bugs, wheel bugs around at that point, also, um, I put on here, even though we do not have a problem with the brown marmorated uh, stink bug here in Florida, um, I know my western, southwestern Pennsylvania relatives have terrible problems with the brown marmorated stink bug. They're just in everything. They are just in everything. But I know they also have these wheel bugs. So, you know, just don't touch it yourself and let him go about and do your thing, do his thing or her thing. Here is a great picture of a Sri Lankan weevil. What can you tell us about weevils, Dr. Lester? Well, weevils in general are a big group, a big family in the beetle order. So we have, there are lots of different weevils here in Florida. Sometimes they'll get, there are weevil pests of stored grains, things like rice and flour and dog food. Uh, different weevils are gonna uh, attack and prey on different plants outdoors. But one of them is the Sri Lankan weevil. And it's not native to Florida. It is an invasive insect. It's been here for a number of years at this point and has established it's not going anywhere. But they'll feed on a wide variety of different plants. We normally and most often see it sometimes on citrus, but definitely most often on crepe myrtles. Mm -hmm. So during the summer, you may see this weevil. They're very small. They're less than a half inch, about a quarter inch long. And they're a very attractive light gray. And they'll feed on your crepe myrtles, but they don't damage things enough so that you ever really have to bother spraying. They rarely get to the point where you have to take action and spray or do anything to protect your plants. And their immature weevils live underground and they're going to feed on plant roots. And then the adults, the light gray little weevils will come out, they'll fly around. It's pretty common out in the garden if you go out there and look around. Okay. Look at this funny looking dude here. Look inside the flower there. You can see there's his eye, mouth parts, little legs there. The jagged ambush bug. These are very pretty insects. Well, that should say a half an inch to three quarters of an inch, I think. There. It's a mistake there. And usually they're that large or a little bit smaller. Um, Ambush bugs is just another smaller group um, in the assassin bug family. And their bodies have little pieces on them and they, they basically sit still. So if you go out in the woods and look through enough flowers, they're very common. You're going to find one. He's sitting in the flower, totally still. And when a bee or a butterfly or other insect lands on the flower, he takes those front legs that you can kind of see. They're shaped like a praying mantis. Mm -hmm. And boom, they grab the insect and feed on him and eat, eat him that way. He looks very cute to me. I think he's-, he's Yeah, cute. and you can only, see, in this picture, you only see its head and its front legs, mm -hmm. but the rest of the body, they're usually very, very well camouflaged. And they're usually the exact same color as the flower. So they mix, they blend in very, very well. And they just sit there and wait <laughs> silently until an insect comes along. Now this one, I have to say, and probably everybody feels this way, just its name bothers me. Its name and its shape. And I guess, you know, you're calling it an earwig. It has these pinchers. It's shaped like it can fit in your ear. And when I was about 14 years old, I sat in a theater and watched Chekhov be tortured by a bug in his ear in the Wrath of Khan. So therefore, 
I think a lot of people that's what they think of because of the unfortunate name of this insect. So can you tell us about earwigs? Okay, well, Chekhov did not have a problem with earwigs. It was from uh, uh, some different species on a, on a different planet. <laughs> um, and I have no idea how earwigs got that common name. Technically, it's in the insect family Dermaptera. So I'm not sure where the term earwig came from uh, or where the superstition came from that they enjoy or they have the goal of getting into your ear but I've never heard of that problem in real life. They do have little pinchers on the back end, and that's used partly for catching food and then partly for mating also. They can pinch you with it as, you know, it's a defensive mechanism too. I've never had a problem with them spraying foul smelling liquid on me, although they can. Um, they could pinch you, but it's not gonna hurt. It's not gonna hurt even as bad as a bee sting. You know, you'll feel it, but it won't hurt. They are generally beneficial insects because they will eat other insects, small things like aphids, mites, scales. Out in your lawn, they'll eat a lot of other um, chinch bugs and other potential pests out in your lawn. Um, different small caterpillars that may feed on your turf grass, they'll feed on them also. So they are technically a beneficial insect. We have 20 or more species here in Florida that can range from very small to comparatively large for an insect. Um, it's just one of those old wives tales. So guys, don't, don't be afraid that earwigs are coming to get you when you move to Florida. Okay, here's an interesting little creature here. Um, millipedes. And from my reading, it just appeared, unless I was reading it wrong, that they didn't want to talk that much about centipedes. So apparently we have more, you know, you're more likely to see a millipede than a centipede. Or how does that work? You see both, and we have both here in Florida. Centipedes tend to be predators. They're going to eat other small insects, worms, things like that. Millipedes are more uh, vegetarians. They're going to eat um, uh, organic matter, fallen leaves, leaf litter, things like that. Funny thing about millipedes is, and this doesn't happen every year, but most years in late summer, if we get a lot of rain, we'll get a few phone calls about people who say, I have a million millipedes in my driveway, or they're sneaking into my garage, or they're outside on the patio. What do I do? What's wrong? And I have no idea why every once in a while uh, something will trigger the population to just go through the roof. If you ever do have a lot of millipedes, just wait, garden, take up golf, find a hobby, and <laughs> in about two weeks, they'll be gone. It's a very short term. It's not a long term problem, but their populations can spike sometimes during the summer. And it seems to tie in with rainfall. I'm not really sure why. Right. They're Maybe not they're insects. Less, probably um, less oxygen in the soil so they're coming closer to the top i would imagine they, they're not they, all you're not going to find them all this bright red color either i mean you might see them more brownish yeah yeah and we have a number of different species we do have one that gets quite large it's a couple inches long and they're they're a kind of attention getting size millipede yeah they're at my front door quite often because they're coming out of the yeah. Arch. yeah. They don't hurt anything. They won't hurt your house. They won't bite you. They won't injure you. I wouldn't play with it or eat it or let your pets or children eat it. Show a little common sense. It's just a, a part of the natural environment outside. Now we're going to talk about spiders. So it's time for the spiders. If you have an issue with spiders, they're coming up. Spider trigger alert, and I am not an expert on spiders. No, but we'll just talk about the kinds that we, you may run across here in Florida. First, the non-venomous, um, the jumping spiders, crab spiders, golden silk spider, spiny orb weaver, black and yellow. How do you say that word, Dr. Lester? Argiope. <laughs> I'm sorry, say that again. Argiope. Argiope. Banana spiders is what we Banana spiders. Call that's that, called. yes. Green lynx spider, wolf spiders, and long jawed orb weavers. That's a great name for a band, isn't it? 
long jawed orb weavers, <laughs> jumping spiders. Um, here's a great picture that Alice got of a jumping spider. They're very small. This is, I think, some of the ones that people do freak out about because they jump. <laughs> you know, you can see the active movement and it seems aggressive, but it's not. They're not. And they actively hunt during the day. So humans run across their activity. Um, sure. And like this picture here, um, it was uh, this spider is obviously in somebody's lawn or brush or leaf litter. They're out there in your lawn, your garden, crawling around, eating other insects. All spiders are predators. They all eat something, whether it's an insect, another spider, you know, um, centipedes, millipedes, whatever it may be, they all specialize in something different. And jumping spiders can be very um, engaging. I know people like to shoot videos of jumping spiders. They have a face that looks mm -hmm. like it's looking at you. And they'll jump and they'll crawl around. So they make for, for very good, very interesting videos. Sure. Other than that, it's just a natural part of the environment. They do not hurt you. They do not want to attack you in the middle of the night in your house. And, it, and we humans are very uh, facial oriented. That is how we as humans communicate. So when we find another organism and it appears to have a face, we are more likely to, um, you know, uh, understand it a little bit better, even a spider like this. Look at that cute face right there. <laughs> How about some crab spiders here? They're kind of almost like the, the ambush bugs, huh? Yes, they are. That's something else that if you go out there and start looking very, very carefully of flowers, you're probably going to find because um, the ambush bugs and crab spiders are going to hide inside of flowers. And when something else comes to visit that flower, then that's their prey and they're going to pounce on them and consume them. Mm -hmm. So if you see it on a flower, it is there to do you a favor. Because if a pest insect comes along, they're there just waiting for that pest insect. They're waiting for their lunch to stroll on by so they can get it. Here we go, this golden silk spider. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> Is that the <laughs> banana spider? No. Well, this- Yeah, it, this I think it's kind of a closely related yeah, one. Yeah, right, right. They are in- you could, you're you likely to run across either of them, you know, in a in wooded lot or even mm -hmm. in your backyard. And if anybody watching has ever been out hiking in the woods, especially during summer and late summer, you may encounter these. You always want to be careful where you're walking that you don't walk into a great big, huge spider web. Mm -hmm. They feed on, you know, most or uh, web weavers are going to be feeding on flying insects and things that they can catch. And I think them and um, oh, we'll get to the banana spider. They are the favorites among those who have been here a little while. And then they have relatives or friends come down to freak out the uh, non-Floridians with the size of these spiders. But you, you know, they can be the size of your hand. They can't, you know, they can't. Yeah, they get quite large. Mm -hmm. But they are harmless to humans anyway. I mean, you don't want to walk, you know, have one on your face. <laughs> but they, they don't want to be there either. And here's the spiny orb, spiny orb weaver, very common. Looks like it came right out of Beetlejuice <laughs> to me. And they're very colorful. We have a lot of different species here that, uh, that it seems like they're all brightly colored, very attractive. They make smaller webs and they're gonna make them outdoors in the trees, um, maybe in your screen porch, pool enclosure. All they do is make a web and catch mosquitoes, which nobody likes and flies and other flying insects. So they're beneficial. As mm -hmm. long as they're not in a place where somebody's gonna walk into it, I leave them. And look at this, you know, this great camouflage. Does that not look like eyes looking at you? There, the mustache and, you know, little smile there. So that it was, you know, nature's way of making it look like something it's not. 
and you know something a mammal of some sort that might scare flower a piece of a plant yeah predators away mm -hmm. here's our banana spider isn't she pretty <laughs> They get huge, and it's the females that get really large. The males always stay really small, and they should be out there this time of year, late summer, early fall, Hanging and they the build house. big, big webs. They do. If you're trying to walk through the woods, like you said, or trail ride on your bicycle, mm -hmm. um, I think people who um, equestrians you know, horses aren't overly fond of these spiders. So they, you know, run into um, issues that the horse won't go any further past the spider. Um, but, you know, um, they need all of their energy, unlike humans where we have piled up plenty of excess um, calorie storage. A lot of these type of spiders, snakes, all that, they really have to budget the energy they expend, the calories they spend compared to what they are going to get out of it. Therefore, they don't want to spend that energy, that, those calories, you know, just biting a human that they are going not going to be able then to receive anything back to, you know, you know, get more calories out of it. It's a very tight budget of energy spent to energy put back in. So these things are not looking around just to bite you. That that's the point of of all of that. Here's a great uh, green lynx spider picture that um, Alice captured here. Um, they're actually pretty common too. You go find a flower, you 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 might be have a good chance of finding in one of these really pretty green link green lynx spiders. Yeah, they're very common, but they're very cryptic because their coloring is the same as plants and plant leaves. Mm -hmm. So very easy to, to miss unless you're looking very closely. And are there also just waiting there? If you see a spider on a plant, a spider is, you know, they're carnivorous. They're there to get the other insects, not to do anything to your plant. So um, they don't really spin webs, but they do use silk to like, support themselves so they can hang out and wait. Um, what type of bug is this guy going after? Some type of some type of plant hopper or leaf hopper. Okay. Yeah, so you know, great. And they have really good insight and eyesight to stalk their prey during the get during the day. So and you know, um Farmers or people with row crops love to see them around because they are assistants. And if you uh, if you went out and just sprayed some kind of insecticide, what are you going to do? You're going to kill your allies, you know, your beneficials who are helping you. Doesn't doesn't make much sense there. This is also very very common and it's up in people's houses. This is what you see people jumping and screaming about seeing. These wolf spiders, um, what do you know about those? They're very common outdoors. Um, if you're out working in the garden, especially around the mulch, let's say you're digging a new garden bed, I've run across them a lot out there and they can get very large and they run very fast mm -hmm. and they always tend to surprise you. So yeah, I, I've been known to kind of jump and scream also. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But you're not out there trying to smash it, though. Now, some of these can get into your house, and you're not going to notice them very often. If you think about it, what they're doing is they're hunting down other insects that you definitely don't want in your house. So technically, they're beneficial. Um, I think everybody at one time in their if you lived in Florida for long enough, you found at least a spider in the house. Sure. It took you totally by surprise. Right, right. And I, you know, I very much um, live by living, live and let live. But, you know, of course, I get startled, too, if one is going to scamper by. Or, um, you know, I was in the shower once and, you know, pretty blind <laughs> in the shower and, you know, screamed for my husband to come and get the spider, which ended up being a black thread on, on the bottom of the floor. So, you know. 
just part of living in Florida. Long jawed orb weavers. There's our band name. I'm a band member of the long jawed orb weavers. <laughs> and they do some interesting things, which um, some acrobatics there. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Um, yeah, I'm not really all that familiar with them. Um, they just have kind of unusual ways of actually catching uh, flying insects. A lot of times they'll like to live near water, which is always an advantage for any insect. It gives you more variety of potential prey when you're near a water source. And they um, do spin very, very small webs. And they, they kind of try to do the acrobatics when they hold on with some legs and catch something with the other legs. So they, they are an orb weaver. They're related to the other ones that we saw earlier, although you can see they look very different. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're going to get into the venomous ones because that's what everybody is worried about. So give us some stories about the the widow spiders. Here in Florida, or especially Central Florida, that's what I'm most familiar with, we do have um, black widows, we have brown widows, we have uh, all those different species, and they're really surprisingly common. If you go out there and if you have, let's say, a shed in your backyard and you don't go to the very back of it very often, or even around your windows outside, you there, will um, find these egg sacs. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're com people commonly find them underneath your uh, grill on your back porch or on plastic, the legs of your grill. Plastic outdoor furniture. Sure, right. outdoor furniture. Yeah. Things where they're, they're kind of left alone and not bothered very often. And they're very common and they eat a wide variety of insects. The problem is you don't want to get bitten by one. And even though um, I'm not sure exactly how poisonous they are, I really am not familiar with people dying from a bite. Obviously, if you're especially sensitive or allergic to it, that's a totally different situation. And if you think you've been bitten by a spider, you definitely want to go speak with a doctor about that mm -hmm. and get, you know, their information and treatment from them but don't think that you have to go on a rampage and get your gloves and your can of raid and go hunting every square inch of your property today to make sure they're not there because a lot of times if they are in the back of a shed that you don't normally go into they're really not hurting anything and you're probably not in the very back of the shed very often anyway you always just want to remember if you're going to go crawling in the back of the shed, be very, very careful and very observant that they aren't there because they may be. We have a lot of them here. Right. My son is uh, remodeling a house in Virginia, his house there. And he told, he said, he took some things apart in the house. He saw these, these egg sacs, these spiky white egg sacs. And he's like, oh, I'm from Florida. I know what you are. And, you know, put them in a plastic baggie and disposed of them. So, okay, this is where Bill and I agree to disagree. <laughs> we have uh, every about once a year or so an argument over whether brown recluse spiders are in Florida. So you go ahead and with your point and I will counterpoint. <laughs> to the very best of my knowledge, the last I've heard they are not established here in Florida. I think technically several of them have been found here but you think about it, if you move here from Pennsylvania, or are they in Pennsylvania? Um, I don't if know. you move they're here from wherever the, they are. They're along the Mississippi River, mostly in Arkansas, South Missouri. Yeah. That's, yeah. I don't There's think There's so much, you know. so much movement of people and possessions and um, truckloads of stuff and pallets and everything else. That sure, if you look really, really hard, you may find a stray one here in Florida, but they're really not established. They're not an issue. I don't think anybody has been documented to have been bitten by a true brown recluse here in Florida. What do you that I know of? What do you call documented? Documented is where they've proven that what they got bit by was a brown recluse. There's plenty of spiders that'll bite you. Right. Plenty of them that will cause injuries, 
there isn't anything so specific about a brown recluse spider bite that they can look at a bite without seeing the spider and tell you that that's what did it. Okay. Well, and like they said, as you said, people move around. So, you know, we're a very mobile society. So it is possible to transport these uh, insects, which may or may not be quote, quote, established here, um, you know, through furniture or boxes or whatever. Um, if you are going to get bit by one, it's probably because it's been trapped unknowingly in your clothes or, you know, rolled out, you know, in your sheets somewhere, which is what happened to a relative of mine. <laughs> um, he, you know, got bit and we found spiders that looked, you know, in their house, which looked a lot like this. And we took that, you know, to the emergency room because he started, um, he didn't realize he was bit right away. And he started to have a, like a, you know, an area that looked like something had bitten him. <laughs> And I will just tell you that remained a very difficult area to heal and, you know, pretty necrotic for pretty much the rest of his life. He had to, you know, it is not what took his life, but, you know, he did, he did struggle with that particular issue. Now, some people say, well, maybe that was a staph infection, you know, not that that, not that came on that quickly with no other explanation so there is our point counterpoint i would just say be real careful you know if you think you've been bit by something contact a medical professional because bill is not that kind of doctor yeah let's go back to those banana type spiders the big spiders non-venomous that you can come across in the woods there's a new one that is probably here in Florida. Tell us about the Joro spider. Sure, the Joro spider is a very large, um, close relative of our native, what we call banana spiders, and it's native to Japan. And they have found them in Georgia, and they're not really sure how they got there. And they seem to be spreading. They're not causing any major environmental impacts They've kind of worked their way in with the other spiders. They're eating the same things. They're not causing um, any issues with populations of anything else. They just kind of work their way in with the other ones. And they spread over time. They can be blown in the wind because they'll um, release some of their um, the thread, the silk that they make their uh, large webs with. And the wind will catch them and they'll blow down the road a mile or whatever. Yes. Yeah, so and they're probably in the state of Florida. They're probably not here in her native county. They're probably up in the panhandle at this point. Yes. Yeah, so people, you know, of course, you know, the media likes to blow things out of proportion, just like you hear about murder hornets and all that stuff. So, you know, oh, there are spiders that fly around the size of your face in Georgia and they're coming to Florida soon. Nothing horribly new. I mean, it's a new species, new, but new or new variety, but it's not probably not going to adversely affect your life. No, they're very large, very colorful, like you can see from the picture here, but they've not caused any kind of detrimental environmental impacts as of yet. And there's really nothing that we could do to stop them from populating and moving around. They're going to end up here one day. Okay, now here's the part that I said that we're going to get to a part where even I, like, no, don't like it, don't want to deal with it. So there you go, Dr. Lester, you deal with these guys. <laughs> sure, here in Florida, we've got, I don't know, 20, 30 different species of roaches, not really all that many. Most of them would prefer living outdoors. They live, they feed on mulch and leaves and decaying materials out in your uh, uh, planting beds, your flower beds and your potted plants. The picture on the bottom right there is a Florida woods roach. They get very large, but they live in the woods underneath fallen logs and that they never ever get into your house unless they get really, really lost and confused. Bottom left is an Australian roach. Those are the great big ones that fly. Upper left is probably an American roach. They're 
very closely related. So those two are the ones that we call palmetto bugs. They, the only way that they're going to take up residence in your house and start to reproduce and become a big problem is if you're like in line to be on the show hoarders and your house is filled with boxes of papers and cardboard boxes and it's a little bit wet because that creates a perfect environment for roaches. They'll move in and they'll be like, hey, this is pretty nice. We're going to stay here. So minimize paper and cardboard. Make sure you don't have any leaks, no wet wood, no wet cardboard, wet paper, and you should be okay. There are times when roaches will accidentally wander in your house. So don't think because you see one, you have a million. You probably don't, at least not with these guys. There's others that you may have a problem with, like German roaches and Asian roaches, which look so similar. It's really, really difficult to take a sample and identify which one it is, but it doesn't really matter because both love living in houses. They will happily set up a household in your kitchen, in your home. Be, if you don't have them, that's great. It, you ha always have to be very, very careful if you ever go out and buy um, used furniture, used stuff, you bring strange cardboard boxes into your house. Maybe you go to your, your uncle's house and he gives you a bunch of boxes of old, I don't know, cookware or something. Because that's how roaches end up in your house. And German or, or Asian comes, roaches are very bad. A kid comes back from a dorm or an apartment. Sure. We've seen things enter houses through somebody else moving in, bringing their clothes, bringing their furniture, bringing their boxes of possessions. Those are all great ways for things that you never had before. All of a sudden you have now. And that's how they came out. What are the best ways to... Um deal with those hire a professional the gallon jug with a little pump sprayer of ritabug is not gonna it's not enough for these guys you're gonna have to use uh, ideally a system of uh sprays baits uh, keeping everything really clean reducing uh spots where they're gonna breed you can get rid of them but you have to follow an actual written plan to do so so a gallon jug just spraying around the baseboards won't work on these guys. That's also a different, um, I notice a difference. Um, you know, I've lived here now 44 years, something like that. Um, lived here since I was 11. So I do notice, you know, that my family up north tends to leave stuff out in the kitchen longer than, you know, someone who grew up in Florida does. First of all, I think it, you know, like milk or something needs to be put away like instantly. And, you know, we are, you know, more concerned with things, you know, like attracting roaches and stuff like that. So yeah, sanitation and, does have a lot to do. And nowadays they have a lot of really, really effective controls for roaches. Um, the different baits that they make are very effective. Mm -hmm. So and if you, you get use those in the walls, behind your um, outlets, you know, all these places like that. Sure, but you have to coordinate it. If you put out baits and then the next day you come along and spray, nothing will ever eat the bait because it tastes like bug spray. Right. And even roaches aren't that dumb. So yeah. you have to maybe spray first to knock them down. Two weeks later, you put out the bait or vice versa, so, you know, depending on your situation and the plan you're following. But timing is important, getting the correct baits is important, putting it in the correct spots. And the most important thing is being diligent. Just become obsessed over it and you will win. Yes, you will. Okay, we're past the roaches. Not that we're, we're into anything super great here, but it is super interesting. And you, I know, wanted um, these the soldier fly larvae um, included in this. So why don't you tell us the stories of this, this uh, soldier fly larvae? And yes, in the photo, it is in what you think it's in. <laughs> so. This is a good Halloween pick, I guess. Yes. But soldier flies are actually flies. And if you, I don't think you have a picture of an adult one in here. It looks like a small black wasp. They're totally black. 
they have long wings. They don't, they don't have short wings like a house fly. And um, they're very attractive insect. You wouldn't think that it was a fly, but their larvae are technically maggots. That's the common name for them. And they eat garbage and they eat animal manure. And researchers have looked at using them because if you're a rancher and you have problems with tens of thousands of gallons or pounds of animal manure, you don't know what to do with it. Let's say you're a third world country and you have huge piles of garbage that's just causing environmental and health problems. What do we get to eat it? They've used soldier fly larvae to do that. So if you raise them and use, like it says here, um, 45,000 larvae will consume 24 kilograms of swine pig manure in 14 days, that could be a pretty effective help if huge amounts of swine manure is your problem. So people will sometimes, if you have a compost pile or a compost bin, they will get into it. Don't panic. They're not creating diseases or spreading diseases. As a matter of fact, to a certain extent, they'll reduce diseases because they can, as they feed on this material, they can sanitize it to a certain extent. So, um, Mm -hmm. and they're very, very important it. part of the natural environment. And they help they to break down stuff out in, out in the woods. The yeah. larvae after it's fed, you know, before it changes to the fly, I guess they use the actual larvae um, to create oil, protein, and animal feed. Also can be a good fertilizer. It's just recycling nutrients in the environment. Mm -hmm. So... I'm not sure how it can be food for fish, but that is what the publication said. So, mealworms, you know. Mm -hmm. Good fish bait. There you go. Now we're going to talk about uh, the carrion beetles. Tell us about these. Sure, we have a variety of different insects um, that will feed on dead animals out in the woods. One of those is carrion beetle. And carrion beetles are pretty cool because they fly and they have an amazing sense of smell. So when an animal dies in the woods or a squirrel is run over alongside of the road, a lot of times within a matter of minutes to a matter of an hour or so, carrion beetles will find it and they'll lay their eggs on it and their larva will break down and consume that dead animal. There's a lot of other insects that are involved in that. There's even beetles that come along and eat the very last components that are left, bones and things like that, that they can actually eat. There's very, very few things that can eat bones, but some beetles can. Yeah. So they're an, an important part of the natural cycle out there that helps us to not be up to our shoulders in dead animals and falling over pine trees and leaves and everything else in the woods. Something, there's an insect out there to recycle everything. Yes. Okay, now this is interesting. And I didn't tell you when we were talking about these forward flies, you know where I first heard about these forward, forward flies, where I first learned about them? Now I used to work in extension too. So you would think that would be the answer. No, I first learned about these um, watching King of the Hill. <laughs> they, have, they have, you know, imported fire ant issues in Texas as well. <laughs> so and they were talking about they put domes over their fire ants and had these forward, fly, forward flies. So tell us, what do they do um, with the ants? Well, first of all, forward flies, there's a lot of different species of them, and we see them they're also called humpback flies, scuttle flies. Another common name for them is coffin flies. And we normally see them at the office. They can become a household pest if they start breeding in your pipes, like the pipe that goes down from your bathtub or your kitchen sink. Because if things get dirty inside the pipe, they'll start breeding in there and they'll cause problems. It's very it, hard to get rid of those, the drain flies, yes. There are ways. So if you have that problem, of course, get a hold of us. Um, they, if you have a broken pipe leading from your plumbing to your septic tank, they can be a problem and they're very, very hard to get rid of at that point. 
But other species are parasitoids because they lay their eggs in other insects and the maturing larva will kill that host insect. So there is a species that will lay its eggs in um, fire ants and the maturing forward fly larva will feed on and chew on the connective tissue between the ant's head and thorax. And eventually its head will pop off. And there are videos online of that happening. So <laughs> Told you. there's everything on YouTube. Yes. All right. And now speaking of parasitizing. This is a beautiful picture here of some. Uh, yes, and very well, common also. If, if yeah. you go out and spend enough time working in your garden, you'll run across big caterpillars with little things that look like grains of rice glued to them. And what this is, is a tiny little parasitic wasp, like the size of a grain of pepper or smaller, laid eggs in that caterpillar. The maturing wasps fed on the insides of that caterpillar and killed it. And then they crawl out and they make little cocoons. So those little things you see on there are going to be tiny little cocoons that little tiny wasps will hatch out of. When the time comes, they chew a perfectly round little circle and open up a little trap door and fly out to do that to more caterpillars. Mm -hmm. For anybody with a vegetable garden, these guys are fantastic because they can give you a lot of control over your caterpillar pests they eat your tomatoes or your cabbage or your lettuce. Pretty much every vegetable crop out there has a caterpillar pest, but these tiny little wasps will help control caterpillars. They help control aphids a lot. So they're very, very beneficial, but they're so small that most people don't even know they exist. Or you see a caterpillar like this, it's like, oh my gosh, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. So that's what that is. It is very interesting that a lot of the what these insects will do because they're not caretakers of their babies um you know they plant the egg right inside the food source that mm -hmm. the larvae will need to continue to grow you know not great news for the host but it's a good system for those who utilize it i'm showing two different types of stink bugs um your predatory stink bugs. You know, there's different areas. I know you're you're squinching your nose up here, but this is the one that Alice found a picture of, the Conquistador nucronatus. It doesn't have a common name. So she suggests not every cool insect does. Yes. So. Um, that's what she found this picture of. And then we'll show the um, predatory stink bug that actually goes after other insects. So what can you tell us about stink bugs? I mentioned the ones in Pennsylvania, the brown marmorated. Those are a terrible pest problem. And we can have some issues, like I've told my Pennsylvania relatives, our stink bugs stay outside being you know, a problem for vegetable gardens. Um, they don't invade our homes, <laughs> like what happened up there. So what can you tell us about them? Here in Florida, we have a lot of different species of stink bugs. They can be pests of a lot of different crops. Any kind of um, vegetable crops that get an actual fruit, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, stink bugs will poke into them and damage them. Stink bugs are the number one pest problem for blackberries. I think also for pecans. When the pecans are very, very small in first form, they'll poke into them. So the pecan, when it gets larger, is going to be damaged and the, the the nut part inside is going to be damaged and unsellable. So a lot of, I'm not familiar with the species of stink bug. We do have uh, southern green stink bugs, brown ones, a lot of different pests, stink bugs. Yeah, this guy too. He we do out. have a few species of stink bugs that don't feed on plants. They're predators, so they're going to feed on other insects. Typically caterpillars, but also depending on the size of the stink bug, they'll pick an appropriate sized insect to feed on. So sometimes plant hoppers, um, there's any, any insect that it can get a hold of that's the right size. The predatory insect, the predatory stink bug will take its mouth part, just like the wheel bug, and poke it into that insect 
and extract uh, its contents, and that's how it feeds. Like a juice box, like you said. Just like a juice box. We will yeah. never look at juice boxes the same again. Okay, so you knew we had to come around to talk about the dung beetles and this is a beautiful one here that mm -hmm. alice is holding in the rainbow scarab and this is a female because it does not have a like the big rhinoceros horn um tell us more about these dung beetles sure they're th this species is a very beautiful beetle we have a number of different species of dung beetles this is the one that you're going to see most often and they're very common here in central florida um and they are dung beetles so this beetle is going to lay its eggs on poo, basically, and that could be in a pasture for somebody who has cows or horses or out in the woods, because out in the woods you have animals and animals poo. So they lay their eggs in that, and the maturing larva will feed on that. Depending on the species, they'll dig a hole underneath it and halfway bury it. So they're recycling it. They're they're doing something with it so that uh, the manure, the poo goes away. I know ranchers really, really in love seeing these insects. Um, they were intentionally released a hundred years or more ago in Australia because they have no native species of dung beetles. Mm. And people moved to Australia and what do they want to do? They want to raise sheep, lots and lots and lots of sheep. Yeah. So they were having a problem where they're like, what are we going to do? The fields are all full of sheep poo now. So they did release, and I don't know what species it was, but they released dung beetles there. Um, but the, this, the rainbow scarab is a native species here, and there are other native species of dung beetles that aren't nearly as colorful. But this is one of the ones that whenever we're teaching kids, we always like to bring dung beetles and carrion beetles, because mm -hmm. two good examples of recyclers that you wouldn't normally think of that are out there in the environment. You know, it just amazes me that you can live your life rolling in poop and still be beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And the other thing here, this dung preferences that I got from the um, publication from the University of Florida, this was the order of their dung preferences, swine, possum, dog, cow, raccoon, and horse, which means some grad students set out various types of manure and then studied which ones the beetles went to. Something to put on your resume, I guess. <laughs> this time we don't really have time for to show the video. I'm sorry, Dr. Lester, but I can um, send it to you if you email me and I will also put it, you know, when I put this up on Facebook, I'll put it in the comments. But in this video, if you can stay real, Quickly, what what are you telling us about these very commonly seen little sand piles that we have? Those are well. First of all, every time you see a little sand pile in your yard, it could be one of a number of different things. If this is the little sand pile that you see most often in February or around that time of year, this is going to be from a different large black beetle that's called a deep digger beetle. And they're only native to a central Florida. And we have a lot of them here, but they don't have a really huge range. They're I think most common around Ocala and Ocala National Forest. And they dig really deep and they lay their eggs down there and they leave these piles of sand, usually the really bright white sand that you get from down deep. Mm -hmm. And everybody, oh my gosh, I have a mole. I have this, I have, oh, what do I? What do I do to kill it? It made a hole in my lawn. Guys, well, first of all, it's not normally a lawn pest because they like really Open sandy, it. thin areas without much grass. And most people have better looking lawns than that. But if you have a really thin lawn, um, like we, this in front of our office, we have them every February. Mm -hmm. And I've taken pictures and I enjoy going out there and seeing the little holes they make knowing that there's a great big inch and a half long black beetle a couple feet deep. <laughs> so uh, harmless, in other words. Sure, they're totally harmless. So before we go, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Lester wanted this story added in, even though it is not, not a Florida bug, but we were so fascinated 
by this story of the zombie wasp, jewel wasp, emerald cockroach wasp. Um, so like I said, it's not in Florida. They're found in various other parts around the world. And would you like to tell the horror story? <laughs> that this... I'm not all that familiar with these. I know that it's a okay. very, very beautiful wasp and they're not in Florida. Okay, well, but, I read about it, so I can tell. I would you okay. like to tell the story? Okay. Um, they, it's an amazing system that these wasps have going on. Their larvae need live cockroaches. Unlike some of the other paras, you know, parasitic wasps where they will eat their way out of a dead caterpillar or whatever, they need live living material of a cockroach to develop. So I like these guys already. And <laughs> what they'll do is they'll come along, find a cockroach, and um, they have to get very specific to get where these roaches, quote, quote, grain, it's ganglia, you know, organ is, and sting it. And that paralyzes the roach for a little while. What it actually does is the chemical that it puts in there it um, includes a lot of dopamine. So the roach, it's only paralyzed you know, for a little bit when it starts coming out of that full of dopamine, full of all this energy for whatever reason, which scientists haven't figured out yet, it's going to spend about 30 minutes cleaning itself. Now, whether that is just something to occupy it so it doesn't go anywhere and it's just you know kind of freaking out, or it's a part of the whole natural system where it's actually, you know, getting, um, you know, dangerous microbes or whatever off of itself, even though the larvae is going to be inside, not on the outside. While it's busy doing that, the um, the wasp has stung it a second time to keep it there, and it it decides, oh, now I got to go find like a chamber, you know, um, I found the wasp. Now I got to go find a place to store the wasp <laughs> and put my eggs in it. And so when it comes back and the wasp, if the wasp never came back, the roach would say, well, that was weird. And it would go on the rest of its life. But, you know, the wasp will come back it will break off a piece of the antenna of the roach, drink up that nice blood to get some nutrients, or hemo, what do you call that? The roach blood, hemo, whatever. Hemolymph. Hemolymph. Drink some of that up, get you know some nice nourishment, and then like grab it by its the rest of the antenna, like horse reins, and saying, you want to go here now, the chemicals that were injected into the roach make it very subservient. <laughs> so it is like a zombie and it just is like, okay. <laughs> it follows where it's being fooled by the wasp, where it finds some kind of cavity, you know, to place the roach in, deposits its eggs, seals them all up. That roach is going to stay alive because it needs to be alive for that larvae. Something, um, the chemical that the wasp put in it is hydrating, but it also keeps it alive, although not moving, not going and zombieized until the larvae grows up. And as you can see from this picture, if you look closely here, just bursts out of the roach. I and mean, then obviously the roach finally dies. That was the story you wanted to <laughs> Me now, see. if that's not a Halloween story, I don't know what is. Yes, that is pretty fascinating. And since it, this the zombieification happens to a roach, I am, uh, you know, I like this story. <laughs> so we, um, I have lots of resources this time. So I have two pages worth. So if you want me to email you some of these, so you can click right on the links and find out where did she get that information. 
of you. And you can also follow up and find out, you know, more details. Be glad um, to share that with you. This last link is one of Alice Mary Hurden's. It is a video of a dung beetle doing its job with a, you know, pretty, pretty large piece of some kind of scat. And, you know, just really, really moving it across to where it needs it to be. And sometimes it'll stop and like go around and look around and make sure it's going the right direction, and start again. So, you know, something you wanna watch. Also, I will add the link to Dr. Lester's little video about um, the beetles in those sand piles. So I still have classes all through November. Dr. Lester needs to take a paperwork break <laughs> from classes because he works for a university that requires a lot of paperwork and he doesn't want to spend December doing it. <laughs> so um, next week I'll be back a little more normal of a class all about mulch, much ado about mulch. You wouldn't think you could talk for an hour about mulch, but one time I asked Dr. Lester to do that for a library talk. And were you able to talk for an hour about mulch? Yeah, yeah, there was some there's an awful lot to talk about when it comes to mulch. Yes. The ninth, I will be in person, so I won't have a Zoom class um, at the Spring Hill Library, um, bringing Florida's fall flower power, which I have given virtually. But if you know someone who just refuses to do virtual classes but would like to hear that, have them come November 9th at 2.30 to the Spring Hill Library. November 16th. Back to virtual Florida friendly gardening, Florida friendly container gardening or ornamentals. Have to be careful about that because if you say gardening, people think we're talking um, from vegetables, and that's Dr. Lester's wheelhouse. <laughs> and then on the 30th, Florida friendly gardening for the seasonal resident. Maybe if you're not here yet, it'll be virtual and you'll be on your way down and you can watch it. Here is my um, social media links where you can keep up with information. Please go to Hernando County Government YouTube. You'll find a lot of videos. I'm approaching 100. I am not quite at 100 yet. Bill has quite a bit there too. So look on our playlists, you know, maybe catch up to some of the things you may have missed. Here again is our emails. Um, if you'd like to email us, for a copy of this, a copy of the links, questions um, that you may have. And we will get to the chat um, when I turn the, the recording off. But thank you everybody for joining us. I think it was a very kind of different <laughs> and interesting program um, this spooky time of year. So thank you, Dr. Lister, for your insight as always. And um, I will see everybody next week and have a great Florida friendly spooky kind of week. Thank you.